Greetings and welcome to the 8th Annual American Library in Paris Book Award Ceremony. I'm Audrey Chapuis, the Director of the Library. Tonight, we will finally be announcing the winning title and hearing from its author. But before the long-awaited announcement, you'll be discovering more about the six shortlisted titles, all of the must-reads, and hearing more about those who make the Book Award possible. The American Library in Paris is a 100-year-old institution in the literal and figurative heart of Paris. Both a lending library and a cultural institution charged with the mission of fostering cross-cultural exchange and understanding and celebrating writers. And like the Book Award itself, the library is the fruit of the time, energy, dedication, and resources of many, and we are here in part to thank them and honor their service. Every year, the prize is conferred here at the George Marshall Center at the beautiful Hotel Talleyrand on the Place de la Concorde in Paris. It's where the Marshall Plan was administered after the Second World War, and we think it's a fitting place to honor distinguished books written in English that investigate, explore, and interpret France. We would like to thank the U.S. Embassy and the Public Affairs Office for always welcoming us here. We'd also like to deeply thank the Florence Gould Foundation for making the Book Award possible, for this year's Book Award patrons, and also to the stalwart supporters of the library for continuing to further the mission of the library, especially during challenging times. To begin the proceedings, we'll be speaking to the head of our Writers' Council, someone whom many refer to as the Doyenne of American Letters in Paris, author Diane Johnson who has been a champion of the Book Award since its inception. Her prodigious body of work explores the lives of those who live abroad and the comedy and insight generated from those cultural contrasts. One of her now classics, Le Divorce, was adapted into a James Ivory film. Welcome, Diane. It's always an honor to talk to you about your work. France has played such a central role in, in your work. How have your ideas about France, the country, the culture, evolved over time? They've, uh, they've evolved considerably, considering that I never was very interested in mm -hmm. France. After, uh, after The Three Musketeers and The Count of Monte Cristo, when I was 12, I never gave France another thought. And then, Fate had brought me uh, to, to France, and I must say, it's a country that I admire tremendously. It's an amazing place. Um, so it was a big surprise to be a trailing wife finding myself in Paris. And so, but it became the central... And then it became, I thought, well, what will I do while I'm here? I'll write a novel about what I see around me, and that, that became the divorce, and uh, then I just went on from there with some of the same characters even, and by then was understanding much more of the culture too, so, uh, so it became my subject, I guess, for du mille, and... Well, I think that's true. In Paris, there's such a concentration of writers and readers, um, you know, we have a, a ready-made patronage. Yes, writing, well, that's writing. true generally of the community, uh, American community in France, don't you find? Yes. It's, it's pre-selected to be people you'll like because they, like you, are here. It's, it's a kind of selection process or something. Yeah. And so beyond the American Library, have libraries always been um, a part of your life as a writer? Um, yes, absolutely. As a child, my mother would take me to the Carnegie Library in our little town. I, I grew up in Moline, Illinois, a town of about 35,000 people. But we had an enormous Carnegie Library, the kind that Carnegie built all around the country. And my mother would drop me there. I don't know what she did while I was at the library, where I would be for maybe four hours. And um, I had the run of the stacks, of course, and, and it was heaven. I looked forward to that Saturday. And ever since then, I think of libraries in that welcoming, important way. In college, the library was always a haven 
quiet and you could work. So writers, all writers need libraries, and I think they all seek them out. But of course, the American Library is unique with its collection. Yes, and then th there's nothing like that for uh, for books in English, which we yeah. which we need. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, thank you so much for your time, and thank you so much for supporting the library and really everything that you do for the library. Thank you, Audrey. It's been a pleasure. And now, a few words from our sponsor, the Book Awards sponsor from the beginning. Just after the last prize ceremony in November 2019, the American Library heard the sad news that one of its greatest and quietest champions had passed away on Thanksgiving. His name was John Young. John was a self-effacing trusts and estates lawyer at Cahill Gordon in New York. In that capacity, to a wealthy client who had long lived a celebrated life in France, John became the advisor and executor of Florence Gould. Upon her death in Cannes in 1983 and following her wishes, he took on the unexpected role of designing a grant-making institution supporting French-American cultural activities. Under his leadership, the foundation provided everything from seven-figure support to the Metropolitan Museum exhibits of French art to $10,000 grants to such small entities as the theater company Word for Word. The American Library was a fortunate recipient over the years of Florence Gould's largesse, notably in its leadership gift for the 2016 library renovation. The library reading room is named in Florence Gould's honor. Just as importantly tonight, John and Mary Young immediately recognized when I brought the idea to them in 2012 that an annual book prize celebrating distinguished writing in English about France was something the Florence Gould Foundation couldn't pass up. And so it came to pass. All of us at the American Library hope you will join us in remembering John and Mary Young and in thanking their colleagues, Walter and Ursula Cliff, Joan Frankel, Freddie Dressen, and Anne Young. Your wisdom and support and Florence Gould's vision and generosity live on tonight. Now it's time to hear from one of our stalwart book award screeners, beginning with Brian Manning. Thank you, Charlie. Every year at about this time, the award process gets underway as books about France begin to flow into the American Library. In 2020, more than 70 titles were submitted. Each of them was read by one or more of the nine screeners. Because of the COVID virus this year, we've read many books in the form of PDFs, whose convenience compensated somewhat for the lack of beautiful covers, bindings, and illustrations. Then in May and June, as the real contenders for the shortlist began to emerge, the screeners met by Zoom to argue for what turned out to be the six finalists. These are the books we sent to the award jury in July, and you will hear from the jury about their selection in a few moments. But for now, here are my screener colleagues describing our choices for the 2020 shortlist. Bill Buford's Dirt, which is his utterly engrossing and informed story of leaving a successful career as a writer and publisher and moving to Lyon with his family to learn the art of French cooking, working in some of its finest and most challenging kitchens. Uh, the descriptions of preparing and eating food are lush orgies of adjectives. I will never ever see Ratatouille in the same way again. The writer gives a great sense of why French cooking has been so important in all cultures throughout history. The Vexations by Caitlin Horrocks. It's an unusual novel with an intriguing subject, Eric Satie, you know, that Belle Epoque composer who rose from the smoky cabarets of Montmartre to give us some of that era's most original, serious music. The book is really about love, family, frustration, genius, 
And Horrocks uses multiple narrators to compose a sati who's just as complex, elusive, and enduring as his works. James Gardner's The Louvre, The Many Lives of the World's Most Famous Museum, chronicles its origins as a 12th century fortress, its centuries as a royal residence, its establishment as a museum in the midst of the reign of terror, and more recently, its foray into Abu Dhabi. The book is full of architecture, archeology, span and anecdote, but not of pictures. Gardner sends readers online to see the great paintings. In this book, the masterpiece is the museum itself. Rachel Mesh, professor of French and English at Yeshiva University and a specialist in 19th century French literature, has given her latest book a title that is possibly misleading, but is ultimately defining. Before Trans, Three Gender Stories from 19th Century France is the extremely engaging portrait of Jane de la Foy, Rachilde, and Marc Montifaut, three bright, complex women who in different ways questioned their gender identity and challenged accepted norms for their places and roles in society. While scholarly and informed, this is not a work of trans theory. Instead, with an understanding of contemporary terminology and categories, Mesh provides a framework that allows her late 19th century subjects to be their full, fascinating selves. Written through the lens of a social scientist, Maggie Pax's book, The Plateau, blends personal memoir with her exploration of a small plateau in the south of France that has a long history of kindness to strangers. Giving refuge to hundreds of Jewish children during World War II and today caring for asylum seekers. Above all, this engaging and timely narrative compels us to grapple with the central question, what makes people and communities do good when things are bad? I am reviewing The Betrayal of the Duchess by Maurice Samuels. It's the 1830s and the Duchess du Berry is betrayed by a confidant, Simone Deutz. He's the son of Paris's chief rabbi who had converted to Catholicism. Charming and morally fluid, Deutz is seduced by the bounty offered on the Duchess, who's plotting on a massive scale to secure her son's place on the Bourbon throne. He leads anti-monarchists to her hiding place and reaps his reward. But in the process, the Duchess has turned into a martyr. The author writes, because a Jew had betrayed the mother of Francis' rightful king, this event, rather than the later Dreyfus affair, set anti-Semitism as a feature of right-wing ideology in France. And now, here to announce the winning title is our esteemed jury, chaired by Ethan Katz, whose book, Burdens of Brotherhood, won the 2016 prize. He's joined by Rachel Donadio, a contributing journalist at The Atlantic, and Paris-based essayist, novelist, and playwright, Jake Lamar. Thank you so much, Audrey. Uh, it was such a pleasure to read all of these books. Uh, and from our far corners of the world, Jake, Rachel, and I uh, convened in a lengthy uh, session that uh, particularly for the two of them went into the late hours of the night as we uh, argued, uh, laughed, and really enjoyed discussing all of these books. It was not an easy decision. Uh, but I am so pleased to announce that the winner of the 2020 American Library in Paris Book Award is The Plateau by Maggie Paxson. <laughs> and uh, I'm so excited that this book uh, is going into the world, especially at this moment when it's so timely, as we'll hear more about shortly. Uh, I'm going to turn over to one of my fellow jurors, uh, Rachel Donatio. Hi, good evening. I'm Rachel Donadio, and as Ethan said, we really engaged deeply with all of these books and learned so much from all of them. It is my pleasure to read our citation about The Plateau. A work of moral imagination, literary skill, depth, breadth, and passion, the Plateau explores a small pocket of rural southwest France, the Plateau Vivare-Lignon, 
whose community took in Jewish refugees from the 1930s through the Holocaust, and which today houses one of France's few centers for asylum seekers. Maggie Paxson, a renegade anthropologist accustomed to spending long months living with her subjects, poses difficult questions about what makes some communities open and others closed, some people good and others not, some generous and others stingy. Wearing her copious research lightly, she places the history of heroic individuals in the broader context of French and European 20th century history. For the moral urgency of the questions it poses, for its ambitious efforts to connect France's past to its present, for its big heart, poetic writing, and genre-defying structure, we applaud the plateau and are pleased to name it the winner of the 2020 American Library in Paris Book Award. Congratulations. Congrats, uh, Maggie Paxson. Uh, I'm Jake Lamar. It's my pleasure to introduce our winner this evening. Maggie Paxson is a writer, anthropologist, and performer living in Washington, DC. She is the author of The Plateau and Solovyovo, the story of memory in a Russian village, in addition to essays in Time, Washington Post Magazine, and other venues. Paxson holds a PhD in anthropology from l'Université de Montréal. She performs as a singer with the Imperial Palms Orchestra, featuring music of the 1920s through the 1940s. She has recently launched a series of participatory events that she calls Bomb Shelter Cafes, inspired by the music and collective art of embattled communities uh, during the Second World War. And I can tell you all, if you, uh, if you go to YouTube and uh, type in Maggie Paxson and pand Pandemonium U as in university, you can hear an interview with, uh, with Maggie that was done by uh, Paris's own um, uh, 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 Patricia, uh, uh, Pamela Druckerman. It's a wonderful interview. And in the course of the interview, Maggie sings. You can hear her exquisite singing voice. So with no further ado, um, welcome Maggie Paxson. Well, thank you. Thank you all so much. I'm so grateful to the American Library in Paris for this award. Thank you to the library director, the jury, and all the organizers and readers. I'm deeply honored. I wish I could be there right now and talk with you all and, and hear your stories um, one day. I will hope for that. Thank you. I must also say thank you to the villagers of the Plateau Vivre Vignon today who teach by glorious example and to the seekers of asylum there who do the same. Thank you to every soul who risked their life to protect strangers during the Second World War and whose actions, however small they might have seemed in the moment, brought life and light to future generations. Thank you from the bottom of my heart to every survivor of the Holocaust who shared their stories. I'm also so grateful to the historians filmmakers, family members, and archivists who gathered, wrote, illustrated, and narrated this precious history before I ever found it. And I am also so grateful to my dear friends, family, and loved ones who, enduring long stretches where I was troubled and lost inside this journey, held me up. Finally, and with a full heart, I thank my agent, Rob McQuilkin, my editor at Riverhead Books, Becky Salatan, and ever and always for it all, my husband, my beshert, Charles King. For years, I got to live inside a beautiful story about a terrible time. It was a story about a group of people who knew how to be good when it was hard to be good. They knew how to be good when there was great scarcity, when bombs were raining down over their country, when police would come to their doors, guns raised. They knew how to be good when every regular instinct would have had them pulling in, hunkering down and protecting themselves, closing their eyes and ears to the suffering of others. But instead of following those regular instincts and in a gloriously illogical way, these people opened their doors. They shared their meager resources, created homes for refugee children, procured false documents, risked their very lives and sometimes lost their very lives 
to protect people who minutes before might have been known to them. What to make of this story? What to make of these people, the villagers of the Plateau Vivre-Lignon, who, as it happened, did this very beautiful thing during the Second World War, but that wasn't the start or end of it. It turned out that they'd been sheltering strangers for different reasons, on and off, for centuries, and they are doing it again right now. What to make of them? For me, an anthropologist by training, the actions of these people looked like a dazzling example of a thing that the world needs very much right now, a template for how to be better, more peaceful, more harmonious, more interconnected, an example that we could hold up and study, looking for patterns, looking for insights, trying to understand what they know that we don't know. So I went to the plateau and I learned that yes, this community has particular qualities that have long supported their way of treating strangers, based perhaps above all on a profound understanding of the essential oneness of humanity. They possess technologies of peace and they live that understanding every day. In doing so, they then attract almost magnetically other people who would wish to do the same. I learned about the ferocity of their gentleness, the power of their meekness. I learned their skill in a kind of holy alchemy, how they are able to see inside the face of a stranger, a friend. It was an embarrassment of riches, what I learned. But my journey to the plateau took another unexpected turn that I thought I might mention here today, as we all share the isolation, the fear, the anxiety, of another moment in time, when we are in our singular humanity, holed up in our homes, trying to stay safe, when in places like my own city of Washington DC, the flames of dissension have been lit and we don't know what will happen next. And we wonder if the time to be good, when it's hard to be good, is right now. The unexpected turn came in the form of a young man whom I am distantly related to and whose story I knew only the vaguest outlines of before I began learning about the plateau. This young man grew up in a family of prominent educators who had high hopes for him. During the tumultuous years of the 1930s, he traveled widely, came to know and love people from different countries, religions, philosophical and political backgrounds, he argued, he fell in and out of love. He was generous, restless, huge hearted, full of, as one of his brothers said, contestation and dreams. Living in Beirut in the mid 1930s, he wrote to his religious parents that he now understood that there was not just one civilization, but many. He wrote that he could now see what was good and beautiful about Christianity, but also what was ugly and false. He sought and sought, but he couldn't find his place. As the war came to France, this young man wrestled with what to do, how to be. He wrestled hard. Should he get his PhD? Should he take a job in Barcelona? Should he become a school director for children of the elite as his parents would wish him to? Then in August of 1942, he received a letter from his cousin, a pastor named André Trocmé, who had been a galvanizing force in the Plateau Vivre-Lignon. André wrote that the community was desperately in need and could use his help with the rescue effort underway. There was a home for refugee children from all over the world who were without their parents, terrified, who needed all the consoling in the world, all the tender and wise guidance in the world. That home for children called Les Grillons, the crickets, needed a director. Could he come and help? After considering his options, this young man named Daniel Trochmi decided to go to the plateau and pitch in. He wrote to his parents that the die was cast, that he would go to the plateau because he wanted to be part of the reconstruction of the world. And because in the end, he didn't want to be ashamed of himself. So he went to the plateau with its habits of peace and great magnetic goodness and he took care of little children there and he fell in love with them 
and he was quickened and changed and lost himself in that love. And so I, who went to the plateau as a social scientist, began to follow this young man there to, to learn his life, to watch his decisions, to try and learn from his heart, from his soul. A year and a day from having chosen to go to the plateau, Daniel found himself in a concentration camp. He had been arrested in a German raid along with a number of young men who were now his charges too. He could have escaped the raid very easily, running off into the dense forests of Vivre-Lignon, but he decided to stay put and speak for the young men and do his best to reason with the authorities. And so today, in a moment, when we are all in a form of isolation, when we are afraid, when so many are mourning, when we are trying to be good, when it's hard to be good, I wish to leave my last words to Daniel himself in the form of a letter he wrote, originally on toilet paper from a French prison camp where he was already hungry, already sick, it was a letter to the children who were his charges back in the plateau, his little crickets. Soon he would leave for Buchenwald and then on to the extermination camp of Majdanek. But now in prison, but still lost in love, he wished to give the children whom he would never see again, some bit of hope. Today, as we all look out our own windows longingly, I need his words. Maybe you do too. Compiègne, September 12, 1943. Dear little and big crickets, it is on a hot Sunday afternoon that I write you on this deluxe paper. When I was leaving you on that morning of June 29, I told you I would have real adventures to relate when I got back. And that has been true even if the adventures haven't exactly been wonderful. Still, I believe that this separation brings us closer in reality because now I will know a little better the adventures that so many of your parents have lived through. We will have plenty of memories in common. You know well that you are never far from my thoughts and one of the greatest joys I promise myself is seeing you again. It will be magnificent. In this letter, I want to tell you two things. First, to those of you who think I will no longer be interested in them after the war and that their adventure and their isolation will resume are wrong. I will never leave you by my own will. You can have confidence and I hope that I will not have to wait too long before I see you again. And then a second thing, this is a recommendation a recommendation for each one of you, from the littlest to the biggest and different in its way for all of you. Evidently, you all have your worries, your qualities, your flaws, your misfortunes, your melancholies, your characters, your anger, your laziness, your pride. Always endeavor, always try to master yourselves. Be united among yourselves and be sure that there are no surprises when I come back with such and such bit of news. You know as well as I have for a long time that our family is fragile. There are always difficulties to conquer. Our big family is so young, it is necessary for each one of us to take care of it like a little tree, like one of those little fir saplings you find on the road to Les Crillons. And each one of us must take care each day, many times, not to break it. Have courage, have determination, have generosity. Be wise and good, my dear crickets, and think of the adults who have endured so much for you and who love you. Nothing creates more evil than an ill-placed word directed at someone we love. So be kind to them, to those who love you and be grateful. Very affectionately, Daniel took me. In Daniel's name, I am honored to accept the prize for the American Library in Paris Book Award. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Maggie Paxson, for that beautiful talk. Um, your reading just brought back the whole experience of, uh, of reading uh, your, your extraordinary book for me. It's, it, it, it's really a, a magnificent piece of work, and, and, uh, and I, I advise everyone to go out and get their hands on it as soon as possible. Uh, congratulations again. Uh, we wish you all a good night. Uh, on, on behalf of the jury, um, uh, bonne soirée. Thank you, Maggie, and from all of us at the American Library in Paris, congratulations. Thank you all for being with us here tonight and for supporting the library. I hope to see you all again soon in the library stacks or at one of our upcoming virtual programs. May 2021 bring you much joy, hope, and many great books. Farewell until the next time. Merci bien, au plaisir de vous parler à nouveau très bientôt.